Um, thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're very much looking forward to things getting back to normal at some stage, um, but for the moment, um, it is exciting that we have these opportunities now. Certainly technology and everyone's embracing of it has leapt ahead during this year. And so I think it does provide us a lot, lot of opportunities to engage with our members, particularly those in regional areas um, uh, over coming months and years as well. Again, thanks to um, both our presenters for joining us today. We'll be over to them uh, very shortly. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's happening um, in terms of the economy um, and in terms of the economy and the ACT and within the region. Um, and then I'll finish off with a couple of little updates about some things that are happening very soon around us. I'm just trying to my screen to move on here. There we go. Um, first slide here. And I should say a thank you to HA Economics for putting this work together. And I probably should start with a bit of a bit of a caveat as well. Um, we obviously have a lot of diversity across the region, and so there is very very different housing markets around the ACT and Southern New South Wales. So not everything will apply everywhere. And I guess the other point is that um, it is 2020, so nothing's normal. Um, and as much as we try and predict what will happen and read the tea leaves, um, it seems every day there's an additional bit of information that seems to um, confound us and contradict what happened the day before. Certainly one of the first, uh, this first slide is looking at shocks to the, um, to the industry and the economy more broadly um, that we have seen or can expect throughout COVID. Certainly the first one of these that there was a lot of concern about was supply supply chain shock. As we saw the initial impacts um, on restrictions of trade to travel, fortunately industry continues to operate and so far um, we haven't seen the problems um, with respect to supply of products um, that we had been seeing. I've just got to Oh, I think we've got a few technical issues there. Dan's just sorted out for me. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, the second issue um, that certainly um, vexed many in the industry was what would happen with consumer confidence in the second part of 2020. Um, and that is obviously around concern that from 1 July, the industry begins to run out of a pipeline of work. Um, we, we lobbied hard along with others for the federal government to um, introduce some sort of support for the industry. We saw the $25,000 home builder um, come in place and all indications are so far that this is doing what it was intended to do, not necessarily in all parts of the nation. Um, regions like the ACT, where possibly the $750,000 threshold for a, um, for a house and land package and likewise the $200,000 household income threshold probably limited a lot of people. Um, certainly in regional areas, it um, has performed very well. We only just saw today um, figures come out that showed that housing finance um, has seen um, a very big increase in demand for residential land. Um, during the month of July, um, it was the first time that lending for housing construction increased since February, and it's actually the highest in two years. So certainly something that we weren't expecting to see a couple of months ago. Again, the ACT is probably, while it hasn't benefited from home builder, it probably hasn't felt the brunt of the consumer confidence shock as it's been somewhat protected through the high levels of um, public service within the ACT and probably being insulated from a lot of other sectors such as tourism and hospitality and manufacturing that have potentially um, fared worse as, as a result of COVID. Um, probably one of the big concerns going ahead is the underlying demand for housing. Currently, the industry has been over the last two years building around enough homes to adequately provide for a 1.5% population growth. This is likely to fall to around 0.5%, potentially leaving an oversupply of homes. To give an idea of what that looks like, a population growth rate of 0.5%, which is really just the natural growth rate without any 
um, the overseas migration, could be looking at around 70,000 dwellings per year, which is down around a third from what we've been seeing supplied to the market over the last couple of years. Um, so there is potential um, for an oversupply to the market, which again could create a shock that would impact on the prices. I've just put up a slide there to show what's happened. The construction industry, as we can see in terms of, um, this is job losses between March and August this year, probably landed somewhere in the middle. 5.3% um, of jobs have been lost um, during this time frame. Um, as you can see, um, it's no surprise that the, the, the likes of accommodation and food services um, are up near the top of the list. That said, within the ACT, um, it has performed probably um, on par with the rest of the country in terms of employment. On wages, um, there's been a fall of 3.5%, which probably puts it um, a little bit ahead of the, most of the rest of the country. And again, that most likely comes back to the large level of public sector within the ACT. And to put that in perspective, the average national decrease in wages um, over the past month has been 5.2% in the negative. And that's, sorry, not last month, from March until August this year. Um, the next slide gives a little bit of a look at house prices. Um, and you can see there the three graphs, the broken line being Canberra and also Sydney and Melbourne. Um, house prices have generally held on better than have been expected. In fact, the ACT has seen a slight increase um, after the onset of COVID. Though that said, house prices are possibly not a great indicator at the moment, as very few people are transacting due to the amount of uncertainty around COVID. Um, we're obviously seeing a lot of policy changes from government at the moment. We've seen the introduction of the National Home Builder Scheme and a number of other programs such as JobKeeper, JobSeeker, um, and some social housing expenditure as well. Currently, stage four lockdown in Melbourne puts the building industry there the only one in the country that is um, seeing restrictions on what they do. Um, that's certainly something we're keeping a very close eye on. Um, for example, some of the key restrictions there, only five people allowed on a site, limits to how many sites that contractors can visit. So there is some real big issues there for the industry in Melbourne. Um, it's fair to say it wasn't handled well when they went into stage four. So. We've certainly been talking to the ACT government to get an understanding of what that might look like. So should in the unfortunate event that we end up going into a greater level of lockdown, either in New South Wales or the ACT, we're in a position for industry to understand what that might look like. Um, another area that's obviously important to the ACT is international education, which is where we've seen a lot of our falls in population growth from. Um, there are schemes underway that governments are obviously looking at. Um, there is a pilot to see how international education can come back and also migration and tourism bubbles in terms of the ACT, um, particularly um, international tourism as opposed to domestic tourism is a very important part of the market. I've got a quick look here at the detached housing pipeline within the ACT. It was already contracting towards the end of last year. This has been exacerbated further um, by COVID. Um, hopefully we'll get some benefit from Home Builder, as I said in the ACT, perhaps some of the parameters make it a little bit harder. Um, hopefully that can provide some uplift to detached housing, again, along with the relatively strong housing market. Um, likewise, a similar situation to the multi-unit pipeline where we saw an unprecedented um, construction boom in apartments over the past couple of years. Again, a downturn that we're already seeing has been brought along a lot quicker um, by COVID. And until we do get that population increase, it's likely to stay constrained. The question of recovery of the national economy, could there be more shocks to follow? Access to finance, the figures released today suggest that won't be the case. Um, but possibly as we look to months ahead, there could well be tougher scrutiny from banks with a lot of people in the country on JobKeeper. It's unlikely that they're to take that into account where people have swapped from being on a wage to being on JobKeeper. Um, that may make it harder for them to get finance. 
Um, and again, if we do see eventually house prices start to fall, that could make it a lot harder for people to get finance. Um, the Australian dollar, watching close um, at what the value of the dollar does, a high dollar will make it more expensive and less competitive to invest in Australia and business may delay investment decisions or even look at moving offshore. Um, so from we're generally thinking from, from 2022, if the population growth does return, uh, international tourism returns, international students return, then economic activity and employment can begin to stabilise. In terms of the time frame, second half of this year, risks that it's a false recovery. We could see the economy cool again in the last quarter um, before stabilising in the second half of 2021 leading into 2022. The next slide gives a bit of a look at detached house approvals in the ACT. Um, again, we, we were on a downward swing um, as we came into COVID um, with building in the ACT. Generally between 1920 and 2021, um, we've only seen a minor uplift before a fall back into 2021-22 within the ACT. And that slide gives you an idea um, of where most of the work is likely to be happening over the next 12 months. Um, looking here at Southern New South Wales, we can see there big falls in Queanbeyan and in the South Coast. Riverina has held up quite well. Um, but again, what we're not seeing here is any impact of the home builder scheme. So we could expect to see over the next couple of these months, some of these numbers look a little bit more positive. Um, now looking at multi-unit approvals in the ACT. Again, there continues to be a strong pipeline of work, notwithstanding coming off a very large um, supply of, of um, high density housing into the market. And again, looking at Southern New South Wales, we can see a slight downturn in multi-unit approvals, um, but again, reflecting the fairly small size of the market and the preference to, for detached home buildings in Southern New South Wales. On that subject in the ACT, in 2015, 2016 was probably where we saw about the low point of detached home building in the ACT, which made up only 20% um, of new dwellings constructed in the ACT. We're predicting that next year, this will get as high as 38%. So that seems to be one out of both the structural downturn in apartment building, um, the building cycle changing, and also as a result of COVID, um, we're perhaps seeing a rebalancing in the ACT toward a little more towards detached housing than we have seen in the past. And we can see there in New South Wales and the ACT falls into 1920, 2021 before a stabilisation in 21, 22. Renovations activity in the ACT, a quick slide there, um, showing a slight uptick in a couple of, um, uh, in a couple of areas, Belconnen, North Canberra, Woden Valley. Generally, renovations has been sluggish in the ACT over the, the past 10 years, has been very slow. Um, and we are expecting that it will continue to struggle to some degree in the ACT. Again, looking across southern New South Wales, 12 months to June 20 this year. Um, but again, hopeful that um, hopeful we can see an uptick there. We're seeing in the ACT from 19 to 20, and these are calendar years, uh, a very stable figure, 2% to zero, then minus 2%. We're seeing a bit better picture in New South Wales with falls in 19, only a fall of 2% in 2020 and an increase in 21. Um, obviously, COVID is one of the very big issues um, for the whole economy at the moment. For those who haven't seen it, I certainly wanted to draw everyone's attention to the coronavirus section of the HIA website. You can get there from the front page of hia.com.au. Um, this is what you're, this, the screen that you'll be greeted with. There's a range of information there to support businesses 
um, from the physical health, um, mental health of their employees, information around the government packages that you can see. And most importantly, looking at the next slide there, these are some of the resources that we do have available to members. Looking at the green cell in the centre, um, this is where you'll find our making space on site guidelines. There's a number of guidelines for whether it's new housing, renovations, small commercial sites um, that give best practice guidance developed by the industry to assist in um, having a COVID safe workplace. Obviously, there are requirements in New South Wales that businesses do have a COVID plan. That's not the case in the ACT, but we're certainly encouraging everybody to access this material, whether it's for best practice or to be prepared if we do find ourselves in a situation with harsher lockdowns. Um, to the left, um, you'll see our COVID site induction tool. Um, that and the one on the right, the site manager, both use a QR code, which allows contactless um, access to induction tools. These are, these are some of the guidelines that you find in that middle cell. So people coming onto your site can read what your policies are. And likewise, if you do need to have people sign in, the tool on the right, the site manager, allows you to do that on your sites as well. So very worth getting on board there and having a bit of a look um, at what we have got available. Certainly, um, it's very important, this environment, that everyone on their sites does their best to ensure that we can stay working. One more thing here for those in around the ACT region, um, you would have seen that we have an ACT election coming up in October. In the next couple of days, ACT will be launching our election priorities. Um, so it's a privilege for this group that you're um, seeing them before everybody else does. Here's a bit of a look at what the document looks like. We've pulled together a number of um, policy areas that we're encouraging the next ACT government, whoever that should be, to focus on to support this industry. As we know, um, everything starts with um, the community having shelter over their heads, whether it's employment, whether it's um, engaging in the community socially more broadly. Um, it all starts with having access to a home and, and we believe that needs to be a bigger priority for the government in the ACT. I'll quickly run through the five policy areas that we've put forward and then I will let you get on with the rest of the evening. Um, certainly housing affordability is very important on the priority and part of that is the government ensuring that there is a genuine pipeline of greenfield land um, into the future. We're also, um, a num among a number of other things, asking that the new government has a look at the number of taxes and fees and charges that are currently levied on, levied on building and renovating. As we know from previous research conducted by HIA, up to 40% of a new house and land package um, can be embedded government taxes and charges. So um, in terms of the ACT, probably the two big priorities is look at the price of land through making sure there's more available and also looking at the taxes and charges that are there on building and renovating. Improved building quality. Um, again, it's disappointing that we've seen the government politicise this issue, issue over the last um, few years when rather than new announcements, new codes of practice, there probably needs to be a greater look at just enforcing the rules that are there at the moment um, and also look at what the licensing system is. As those who work across the border would know that it's a very different system in New South Wales um, and so there needs to be some more work done there. Um, reduced red and green tape, we've seen those building in the ACT would, would certainly understand what this means um, and a lot of new requirements coming in on home building that we, we list within the document that we think a government needs to have a look at to encourage more building. Um, improved planning and housing choices. Um, the government's been talking about um, reviewing the territory plan for a number of years now that needs to be looked at. There needs to be more resources into the planning system to ensure that approvals are turned around much quicker. And if we are gonna look at increasing the density of the ACT, we may need to look at how it can be quicker and more efficient for low scale development. Um, similar as in New South Wales, to have code accessible, um, small townhouses, manor house developments in RZ2, and also looking at in RZ1, to be able to have dual occupancies on a sensible basis.
Um, and the last one, deliver faster and fairer dispute resolution. Um, we're calling for introducing a, what I've called a building court. That's a jurisdiction within the magistrate's court that has a panel of experts. It would be overseen by a magistrate, but that we do have experts in the building industry and also built into that an alternative dispute resolution. So whether it's for the consumers or builders, it's something that's plagued the ACT for quite some time. Um, and it's certainly something that we need to have a look at to ensure that we can have a better building outcome for the builders and for the consumers. That's it for me. Thank you very much for your time. And um, I'll certainly be around at the end, but um, members should know where to find us in the HIA office. And so please, anytime um, you do have a question on these or any other issues, please never um, hesitate to get in contact. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much, Greg, for, for taking us through that economic report. Um, I'm now going to hand it over to Derek Pryor from, from Safe Work New South Wales. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my, my name is Derek Pryor. Um, I'm the manager of um, uh, construction services for the um, southeast of, of New South Wales. Um, before I kick off on uh, the presentation, I did want to pass on a few thank yous. The, the first one's to uh, Greg and Dan and the HIA generally. But, um, we wanted to acknowledge the, the great work of the HIA and um, just, just for the HIA members out, out there, to, um, uh, our involvement with the HIA um, uh, is a positive experience for us and it helps us um, understand the industry better, um, target our, our, um, our resources better and ensure that we keep regulation as, as practical as we can. Um, now, um, Greg just gave a, a fantastic oversight um, of, of the economy and Mostly when I come to a presentation, I, I don't talk in depth about the economy, but it really does um, link into to what I'm here to talk about primarily today, which is COVID safe sites. Um, everyone from the associations um, uh, through to, to builders and, and um, subcontractors and workers has an interest in getting this right, making sure that we've got COVID safe sites and making sure that we have um, uh, an open and functioning economy. You know, we want people employed. Uh, we want the industry making money. We want people to to um, have houses built and great places to live. And this is just one of those where we all have a common interest in getting it right. So I'm going to take you through a, a few simple and and practical measures, um, and then have a bit of a chat um, about a program that we've got up and running inside the industry and the things that we're finding. Um, in doing that, uh, Greg mentioned uh, the great uh, resources on the HIA website. Um, so to, to put our full weight behind that, um, the, the HIA acted very quickly um, and in, ensured that there was good information out there and reliable information and, and had it checked um, uh, uh, back through the relevant regulatory authorities. Um, and you, you've got our full assurance that, that um, uh, if you, look at that material and implement it as, uh, as best you can, um, then you are achieving a, a COVID safe site and you are doing exactly um, uh, what we would hope you'd do uh, to, to uh, keep things safe and the economy running. So um, into um, some of the detail, um, uh, nice simple message. Um, you know, we've got to keep our communities safe at the moment, but we've got to keep our economies running um, and most importantly, we've got to keep construction running because it, it uh, feeds the economy and without a strong construction sector, um, things go downhill much quicker. So businesses do have to take some action to um, prepare and manage the, the risk of exposure to COVID um, for, for workers and, and of course themselves, um, so far as practical. The, 
The um, four or five main elements in doing so is just hygiene practices. That's a real fancy way of, of saying, making sure that there's um, some way of washing um, hands on site. So the, in, inside that, um, it could be anything from um, uh, pump stations um, uh, that you might see in some of the cafes, uh, you know, through, through to ultraviolet systems and all this sort of stuff, but um, just keeping it practical and simple, what it means for residential construction, make sure there's some running water um, and uh, a bit of soap out on, on every site um, and that it's accessible. Um, physical distancing, now th this is an interesting one. We openly know uh, that in not every instance in every construction task is it possible to maintain the 1.5 metre distance. In fact, in some tasks it's going to be more dangerous, right? So generally what we are trying to say there is so far as possible, try and look at physical distancing. So the first uh, method there is have a look at um, how um, uh, the industry is structured and try and coordinate your trades a little bit to, to um, have a one trade on site um, uh, set up. The advantage of that um, is it gives people working space um, and it doesn't um, uh, mix uh, potential exposure sources. Um, uh, and then where it is possible and it's reasonable to do so, um, uh, general reminders to, to people on site to, to keep their distance from each other. Workforce um, health screening. Um, again, I find that very government terminology. What we're really getting at there is just saying if someone is sick um, and displaying those common symptoms of uh, a runny nose, um, sore throat or fever, Normally, you know, the, the social reaction to that is um, uh, soldier on, right? But at the moment, really, that, that is no, pack up and go home. Um, uh, the, yes, it is unlikely. We are lucky to, to uh, be, be living in the, the um, southeast of New South Wales and in Canberra where we have low exposure rates, but um, to, or, or low instance rates. And uh, to, to ensure that that's the case in future, we do have to, to um, take that very precautionary stance. And yes, you know, it probably is just a cop, but until those symptoms clear um, and someone's been tested, they shouldn't be on site. Uh, a COVID safety plan. Um, again, um, there, there is, is one on New South Wales uh, uh, Health uh, website and uh, Service New South Wales, if you just do a COVID safety plan for, for construction, and uh, building trades, uh, you'll find one there. It's only um, three pages um, and most of the details um, uh, put in. The idea behind that is more just to make sure that you're thinking and, and uh, preparing. Um, can I, I just say, um, I, I do very much like uh, the, the material that's put, been put together by the HIA and again, give the, the full assurance that that's about the, it is the same, the equivalent or, or better than, than uh, just the standard safety plan. Um, now, the, the last one is um, records for contact tracing. Now, um, I, I had the uh, pleasure of um, uh, leaving my desk, which is happening less and less often these days, um, but I did get out um, with some inspectors uh, uh, through, throughout Googong, um, and um, I did see the HIA signs up with the QR codes and was able to, to register um, to, to enter a, a site and have a record there. So. That, that's all about contract tracing. You know, in, in the unlikely event um, uh, that, that um, uh, a, a, a instance does occur on site, um, making sure that, that uh, tracing can be done quickly and effectively um, closes down the, the issue um, and, uh, and ensures that the rest of the economy keeps ticking. Now, I know that um, in saying that, um, there will instantly be some worries um, uh, in and around what that'll mean for, for the individual site. So I'm gonna take you through experiences from other industries um, and, and how well that has generally worked. Um, and uh, the reason I'm, I'm gonna talk to other industries uh, is because we're, we're yet to have a confirmed um, case on a construction site that required um, uh, follow through um, contract tracing. And I certainly hope that that, that is the case. So. Again, just reinforcing what to do um, if a worker is suspected. Um, so again, just cold or flu symptoms, um, just make sure they stay away from the workplace and encourage them to seek medical advice or, or better yet, get a test. Um, now we acknowledge all you can do is encourage and, and guide, 
um, but you can also set the, the policy that uh, they don't return to, to site until they've got clearance. Um, uh, clearance rates at the moment are, are taking less than 24 hours, so it can be a quick turnaround. So you now, if a worker is confirmed um, uh, of having um, COVID-19, um, ensure that they don't return to work while they're infectious and seek advice from health authorities immediately. So just, just to um, take you through what would happen um, if a case is confirmed. Um, after um, confirmation, they, they look to isolate relevant areas. Um, uh, once, once the health authorities have been notified, uh, they turn around and, and experts um, appointed. So it's not a safe work inspector or a work safe inspector. It's actually a health professional um, guided by doctors and the like uh, to, to give very specific advice. Um, usually the, the advice um, uh, uh, includes um, turn around and, and uh, get a forensic cleaner in um, and have the uh, surfaces sprayed down. Um, once that's done, um, it's certified by a hygienist and the, the um, site is back up and, and running again. Now, that, that's what's happening uh, in cafes. Essentially, health services notified um, after the health services are notified, um, uh, appointed, um, and uh, and then a forensic clean. Um, I'm not sure the level or extent of forensic cleaning that, that would happen on a construction site. Um, thinking of the how uh, the structural phases um, of a house build, um, basically open to, to the elements um, and uh, turned around and um, uh, UV exposure and all that that sort of stuff. Um, I, I think, uh, well, I, I do know from the virus studies um, that just in, in general surfaces, um, you're talking 24 to 48 hours um, uh, before the, the um, virus is 99% or in 99% of instances, the virus is dead. Um, um, translating that information to a construction site uh, that, that has those direct exposures to the elements, I, I would imagine it'd be quicker. So I, I, I'm not sure, but I would generally understand that the requirements of cleaning uh, that had come from your health authorities would be uh, quite a deal less for, for your open um, uh, construction sites. Um, right, moving forward from there. Um, so uh, both uh, New South Wales and ACT um, uh, inspectorates have been out about um, uh, having a look at um, uh, COVID uh, preparedness on, on construction sites. Now, I want to make um, absolutely clear that, that um, we are operating in primarily um, uh, an assistance and capability um, our capacity. This is not something, um, uh, as you can see from the stats, that we're, we're looking at um, fines on. We really have that common interest of, of making sure uh, that, that sites keep running, uh, that, that uh, profits are made and that people are employed. Um, but taking it to our findings, listen, 90% of the industry out there is doing really well with this. And that, that's your mix of your big builders and, and uh, your smaller home builders. I think that's a recognition that we, we have to get this right for, for our economy. Um, so uh, out of 145 sites, um, uh, which was the, the data from yesterday, um, we, we had roughly a 10% non-compliance rate. Um, I don't like the word non-compliance in relation to this. So I, I think it, I should have just written a 10% um, uh, required improvement rate. So we, we've on, on 14 sites, um, we've issued roughly 24 improvement notices. Again, they're not fines, they're just formal requirements to, to um, uh, have a system or a practice improved over a period of time. Uh, but out of that, most of them were for hygiene practices, which is just you know, simply make sure there's um, uh, running water and soap. Um, from, from there, there have been some notices um, issued on physical distancing. And these have really been quite extreme cases where we've had um, trade on top of trade on top of trade um, and, you know, uh, the, you know, all, almost literally, you know, um, uh, tens of people uh, in a space where there was just no reason for, for them to be. But, um, uh, we, we have issued four improvement notices just, as, just on wellness screening. Uh, again, for HIA members that, uh, oh, sorry, um, on wellness screening, so just making sure that people with symptoms are being, um, are being asked to, to leave site. Um, and five notices just on record uh, keeping. So again, taking it back to the great work of the HIA, uh, know that that information is there and the QR codes are, are, are there and, and uh, ready for, for you to use. 
uh, just to make that that easy and, and that is 100% compliant and both myself and my inspectors will use that system when we come to, to your site and more than happy to. So again, taking it back to the capacity building um, piece, you, you can see, okay, a couple of improvement notices, uh, a, a, um, a little bit of verbal direction, um, uh, but also 355 pieces of advice. You know, for me, this is the one um, that as industry, we step as one, we get it right, we, we keep it open, um, we keep it functioning. Um, tips for a COVID safe site, um, just promote and inform for the work um, uh, workforce, try and set the, the right example. You know, uh, we're usually not the biggest fan of remote inductions and, and things along those lines. But we did put out a um, statement of uh, regulatory intent um, and uh, you know quite clearly at the moment you know things like Skype inductions or a mobile phone induction. Uh, I, I should clarify as well um, in housing uh, industry uh, we understand that, that that's a practice um, of simply saying it you know, if it can be done face to face it's better acknowledging all, all the challenges and distances and multiple phones um, and the like so it's not always possible even without COVID. But um, so far as you can, one trade at a time. Uh, again, just looking at the way industry works, um, that's a very efficient and practical way uh, uh, to, to manage um, our trade works um, on your sites. Uh, not always possible. A uh, bit of a cleaning regime, uh, particularly around common surfaces and that sort of stuff, probably more towards um, uh, when you're um, doing your completion phase and everyone's inside and that sort of stuff. Um, uh, we would encourage uh, the federal government's close contact app, um, you know, mobile phones, site registrations, QR codes. Um, for those that have bigger developments um, uh, using uh, larger trade bases, um, consider travel arrangements because that's come up a couple of times where, for instance, larger formwork companies uh, traveling to yeah, multi-story residential home are traveling um, you know, in the one uh, company vehicle and the like. Um, and there, there are some health guidelines around how, how to manage that. And just keep an eye on and monitor hotspots. Uh, th this has just become part of my day-to-day my -day living um, with uh, inspectors uh, all, all throughout the southeast of, of New South Wales. Um, you know, we, we do have, uh, it probably doesn't meet the technical de definition of hotspot, but we are um, careful around the Southern Highlands um, and uh, and the Greater Illawarra uh, because there are, um, I, I think uh, between the two, there's nine active cases, um, but it, we've got different directions to, to our staff and um, and uh, different responsibilities and the like. So it is, is something to, to monitor um, and um, yeah, ad adjust as you see fit. Okay, so, um, now, what I thought I'd do, um, the, the COVID conversation is a bit everywhere at the moment. It is, is something that we, we want to get right, but I also know that, that most people listening right now have been out working hard all day, uh, and COVID's probably not, not the most interesting of topic for them. So we thought we'd married this up with a little bit of crane safety um, and uh, a video, uh, a short video. And we're hoping that the video is much more entertaining than my voice uh, and also as good as a cup of coffee.
Okay, so I'm, I'm rather hoping that um, a, a couple of uh, crane car crashes there um, have uh, 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 piqued the interest again. Now, um, we, we realise that the video we, we have shown mainly relates to um, uh, larger commercial sites um, and or industrial sites and, and is less relevant to, to housing industry. Uh, but we also know that uh, cranes, um, whilst they are a very practical bit of kit um, and uh, where they are used, they're you know, strongly encouraged uh, uh, for, from our side of things to, um, uh, as the safer manual handling option. We, we also know that residential construction uh, and, uh, and residential builders do use them from time to time. Um, uh, there's a couple of key things that, that um, uh, we would like to, um, builders to look at um, as they turn around um, and uh, engage a um, uh, engage a crane company. So the, the first one's just preparation. Um, uh, in in ordering a crane, um, we want to just make sure um, uh, that you provide appropriate information to say that the right crane is supplied. In the simplest terms, that's going to be um, how, what's the heaviest thing I'm lifting and how far do, do I need to move it from where the crane has to set up. So they're the two key factors that will turn around and, and allow a crane company to determine the size of the crane that has to come. Um, uh, everyone here will know um, if you lift uh, 20 kilos close to your chest um, from, from the ground, um, uh, it's easier than lifting, lifting the same weight um, at your full arm's length extended from, from the, uh, your body. Um, yeah, you know, there's all sorts of physics behind it, and you know, there's uh, uh, the meter tonnage um, that the crane specialists uh, tend to talk in, and things along those lines. But uh, essentially, the further out you go, the more force that's going to be applied, the bigger crane that, that you need. But, um, so the next thing in in uh, preparation um, is just ensuring that the the site's adequately prepared to to take the crane. So. Um, that, that's going to be things like um, making sure that you've done your dial before you dig. Um, you know, if you've already done a bit of preparation work, um, just having an assessment whether you're dealing with um, virgin earth, or whether you're dealing with spoil, um, turning around, um, having a look for any common, uh, uh, you know, uh, common things like service pits and, and the like. Um, obviously, any of those things would, would um, uh, means that the way you would set up a crane, well, preferably don't set up a crane in those areas. Secondly, if the crane is set up, that it's set up with larger pads and, and the like. Um, so that's your underground. Obviously overhead, you're looking at um, your, your power lines and, and other obstructions. But um, simply planning it out um, and as a part of the planning, ensuring that, that um, uh, you've run an eye over and you've thought where the crane will go to, um, uh, goes a long way to ensuring safety. Um, now, um, uh, the next one's just ensuring appropriate um, approvals. Now, in most instances uh, in residential construction, you, you won't need them, but uh, where necessary, you know, like your, your road uh, closures, uh, and then if you're operating close to overhead power lines, um, uh, some communication with the supply authority. But, um, when you um, get a crane in um, uh, and you speak to your uh, crane contactor. We don't expect you to be an expert uh, in terms of uh, doing a check on crane, but we, we do uh, think that there's some simple measures you can take. So the crane company should be able to provide you your design and item registration. What you're getting in that information is confirmation um, that uh, that crane is safe to use in Australia. That's your design stuff. So the engineers have looked at it and that's uh, a safe crane. Your item registration um, turns around and shows that that item of plant has been inspected, um, uh, usually by a competent engineer, um, annually and then uh, uh, six yearly. Uh, sorry, ten yearly, I should say. But, uh, next one is uh, just the high risk work licences um, and confirmation of, of experience. You know, so if anyone's coming to your site who has very little experience, um, that that's fine. It just means that some level of supervision has to be provided. But, um, uh, the, the next one is, uh, of, of course, uh, cranes in close com uh, proximity to their power lines, um, having a, um, uh, the spotters tickets and, and the like. Lifting gear inspection records, and then a size spe uh, specific safe work method statement. Now, all of that sounds like a lot, 
my experience is, um, and I've, I've had to coordinate a large number of lifts on behalf of SafeWork New South Wales now, my experience is most crane companies, if you ask them for that information, will supply it um, in a standard email that's ready to go. Um, so, uh, you know, the beauty of digital communications these days. And if they don't have that material ready to go, um, are they the organised um, and, I guess, compliant business that, that you want to be dealing with? So, um, th those that do undertake that work, obviously, that takes a lot of responsibility from you because, you know, you, you can't, most of us can't check a crane and say that it's mechanically sound, but we can get uh, the paperwork showing that it is through the registration. Um, checking slings, um, okay, or lots of physical damage you can see. Um, but lots of other wear and tear and chemical damage you can't see. Um, but getting the, the records takes the pressure from you because you know an independent's done it. Um, very similar to the training and the like. Um, just on site, um, you know, ensure that people are inducted as you would for anything else. Um, make, make sure that they've got a load, load chart. Um, and um, again, that can come across in the pre-lift information if you like. Uh, if they've got log books um, and then, you know, that the log books are actually used. So from a government perspective, we would say routine and breakdown maintenance. Really, that means that there's the occasional record in the log book um, because there is no crane uh, that, that uh, uh, doesn't have issues from time to time that shouldn't be recorded and closed down. Um, right, yeah. So it, that's about it um, uh, for crane safety for, for builders. Again, I really want to reinforce the, the message that a lot of this is just about planning as opposed to expertise. Um, now, there will be people um, that I'm, I'm talking to today that have a higher degree of expertise than some of the crane operators that come to site. If you have that degree of expertise and you have um, uh, and you want to take on that level of ownership, there's nothing to stop you doing that. But there's, equally, there's nothing um, to stop you um, taking on a more planning and systems orientated way uh, to ensure that you get safe um, plant and safe operators out onto your site. Um, now, um, uh, we'll, we'll work to, to uh, get this co-badged over a period of time because the, the requirements are exactly the same between uh, WorkSafe ACT and Safe Work New South Wales. But, um, we, we do have a fact sheet, which is just roles and responsibilities when hiring or using a mobile crane. So if you are looking at it um, uh, and, um, you know, it's not something that, that uh, is common or that uh, you're experienced in, or if you're finding that you're relying heavily on your, your subcontractor, um, uh, you can have a look at that and it'll um, just cover off the critical points that we've talked about. Um, uh, I, I think all of that um, uh, took me about um, five minutes to say, or maybe 10 minutes to say, mm -hmm. but in practice, when, when I've been asking for this information, um, it really is an email. I want this um, and it's provided by all your credible crane companies because they are used to providing that information and it's part of what they do. All right. So. Um, now, um, I'm lucky enough to have uh, Matt from um, uh, WorkSafe ACT and uh, you've I've, I've almost had a moment of dyslexia there where, where uh, I nearly said safe work and then I couldn't remember which way around it went. It's uh, got to love the government. Uh, one's uh, safe work and the other one's work safe. <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, what we thought we would do um, is just throw open um, to, to have an open uh, uh, panel uh, where we could answer any questions that, that come through. Just, just as you guys are thinking about your questions um, and, uh, and the like, um, uh, Dan was uh, good enough um, uh, to seek member feedback earlier on and, um, and uh, we do have a small list of questions here. So. Uh, the first question that, that we got um, is, um, how is um, Safe Work Work Safe uh, approaching WorkSafe's uh, re-COVID? Um, I, I hope I've covered that off um, and you know, I hope that uh, we're talking genuinely and practically um, and I hope we're stepping uh, as one, but we will look forward to your feedback. Um, Matt, would you like to add to that? Yeah, so I guess talking from our WorkSafe ACT's perspective, um, the same approach as New South Wales, we recognise that COVID-19 is a, is a new challenge for our construction um, and all other industries. And what we're looking to do at the moment is just to make sure that we don't find ourselves in a situation where the hazard has, I guess, gotten out of control like some of our interstate counterparts. 
So it's a very uh, supportive approach. Um, we're out there to try and educate as much as we can. I'm happy to say that of all the sites we have visited over the last two days, we've had a 90% compliance rate. Uh, and the 10% that uh, has slipped a little bit, um, we have been able to provide enough education and advice to, uh, to get there where they need to be. So it's been a great success from our perspective. Uh, and we'd like to thank, I guess, everyone for their efforts um, in their COVID-19 preparation. Um, so that's, that's what we're up to. So New South Wales um, and ACT are aligned on this. Um, and uh, that's why we're both here tonight to answer your questions. All right. Um, the, the next question we had on the um, uh, sorry, the next question that um, we had on the sheet um, related to uh, free training um, or info for industry. So I'll try and give a three-part answer and then then hand over to Matt. The the first one is we we try and work um, uh, heavily in uh, with great organisations such as the HIA. Um, uh, on, on a very personal level there, um, I, I gave an industry commitment, um, particularly um, for our remote and regional um, builders in the southeast of the state. We, we will, um, uh, on invitation attend, uh, we will give the best presentation that we can and we'll contribute to making sure that regional and remote builders can maintain their professional development points. There is no circumstance where we won't give it a go we're in the middle of a COVID crisis and, and I'm talking to a screen <laughs> and uh, and I hope I'm doing okay, right? But uh, even in these circumstances, that's that's the commitment we gave and that's what we're going to do. Uh, next one from there is uh, in, in New South Wales, we do do presentations on, on request. So uh, what, if you're a larger builder, um, uh, you'd likely you would know that already um, and you can access the services. Uh, just just by calling thirteen ten fifty or sending work cover sorry excuse me safe work and email um, uh, the final one for for smaller builders um, very similar service we we would just ask if at all possible um, link in with a couple of builders or a couple of other trade people so that when we put our resources into it um, uh, we're reaching as many people as we can that was the second part of the answer the third part of the answer is. Shortly, um, uh, we will have uh, free online uh, supervisors training uh, that, that will be available in uh, webinar format. Uh, uh, formal announcements on, on that will, will come uh, uh, shortly and, and we'll get the information out via, via Dan and, uh, and uh, Greg to you all. So uh, over to Matt. Oh, just in training. Yeah. yeah, so um, in regards to training, we, are, we offer a similar service. So I'll put it out there, if, uh, if builders are large or small uh, requesting WorkSafe inspectors to come out and talk about any topic, it could be uh, swims, it could be COVID, uh, if you just contact us. Uh, to mirror what uh, Derek has just said, for the builder sites, um, for, sorry, for the bigger sites, we're happy to come out to the site. For the smaller sites, uh, if you can get together with some colleagues, uh, that works better for us because we can cover more ground. Uh, so, for example, we did a swims uh, we did a swims talk today with one of our local builders, which uh, by all accounts went really well. So, don't be afraid to tap in. Um, if you see an inspector on site, uh, they will let me know that you requested it, uh, and then we will go about allocating the resource to uh, help you out where we can. So, uh, don't be uh, don't be shy when it comes to asking for advice. Um, so we, we have about three minutes left. Uh, we do have a few other questions on the screen. Uh, we'll ensure that we answer those and, and get them back uh, through through Daniel to, to all the members. But the, the uh, last question on the sheet before me was, can um, builders appeal any decision made by Safe Work WorkSafe? The answer to, the, to that is most definitely. So uh, personally, be before uh, running the South East, I was an inspector. Um, you know, we're roughly talking 15 years. Um, I, I operated with integrity and, and with a degree of passion, but I can guarantee you I did not get everything right in, in uh, 15 years. And uh, if you've had everything right in the last 15 years, uh, can you come teach me how to do it? So along those lines, uh, first point, we'd always say have a discussion with the inspector themselves. Um, and, and just run them through it. Um, I've had many instances over the years where inspectors have come back to me and gone, oh, boss, yeah, I've looked at this one and it wasn't right. But, um, the next one from there uh, is um, 
uh, where I'm pretty open. Um, I, I would get probably um, two calls put through to me a week um, uh, just in relation to questions and, and the like. Ha happy to, to run through that process um, uh, should it help. The next one is more into the, the um, formal um, uh, formal items. So on the back of any uh, notice that, that's issued by us as a regulator, there's formal rights of a, appeal. The first one's an internal review, which is completed outside of my team. Um, and uh, they, they just have a look at it and the evidence and make a call one way or the other. Uh, and the final one is, is a, a, a court review outside. In a practical sense, um, what, what we would say is, you know, we want to get this right. Our goal is just a safe work site. If we've got them wrong, let us know. Um, uh, if you disagree, let us know. Um, if they're otherwise right, um, just infuriating, we just encourage you to get on and, and uh, deal with the issue. Uh, probably very quickly, I'd just say, um, also speak to the HIA. Um, if the HIA brings a concern to us, we will listen. Um, we, we may not always agree, but we will always treat it seriously um, and make sure that we work through and resolve the issue or explain ourselves as well as we can. So, yeah, uh, over to Matt. Yeah, so uh, in ACT, uh, same process. So um, I guess the first port of call, um, if you disagree with an inspector, then I encourage you to uh, have that conversation. Uh, I would always encourage that to be in a respectful, respectful manner. Uh, because we're all working towards the same goal and that's the safety of workers on our sites. Uh, and then from there, if uh, if it needs to go to the next port, uh, we do have an internal review and then we have an external review, much like New South Wales. Uh, you'll find all the details on how to do that on the back of our notices. Um, and then you can always ring us. Uh, so any questions at all, first point of call is always the inspector. Um, if we're going to escalate the review process, um, then read the back of the form. Any questions, just give us a yell. But uh, every, everything is open for discussion uh, because once again, we are human and uh, we don't always get it right. Um, that's the unfortunate part of it. So, uh, If I had more time, I'd, I'd run you through uh, when I thought uh, uh, every bit of form work needed to be backed by an F-17 bit of plywood. Not my finest moment, I can assure you. <laughs> Luckily, that that was uh, some 17, 18 years ago now. But um, right. Um, so just just as we wrap up, um, uh, huge thanks uh, to a ACT WorkSafe um, for for um, being here with us today, and a huge thanks to, to the HIA and also yourselves. Um, we realise that most people here have been out working hard, and uh, it, it is appreciated that you've taken a little bit of time uh, just just to uh, brush up on some of the the safety aspects. So. All the best as we get through uh, the COVID crisis, and and, um, and you know, I genuinely hope we all work together to to avoid what what's um, happening uh, uh, south of our borders, because you know it's a real challenge. All right, thanks to all, and um, I'll just pass back to Dan.